Welcome to another episode of Wellness Curated. This is your host, Anshu Bahanda, and my aim with this podcast is to help you lead a healthier, happier, more hopeful life. This season, we're focusing on social well-being, and today's episode is about overcoming bias, where we will be exploring the challenges of prejudice and embracing diversity. Now, this episode is very, very dear to my heart because I was brought up in a very inclusive family and it still rattles me when someone is excluded. And that's what today is about, trying to promote inclusion. We're joined today by two very inspiring activists who've turned their personal experience into dynamic forces for social change. We have with us today Shweta Agarwal, who was spearheading a successful Bollywood dance company in London. She made waves on Britain's Got Talent, and she's done a bunch of other interesting things in her life with events. And now she's turned her talents to a very profound cause, advocating against colorism. And it stems from her personal experiences. With us today also is Rudrani Chetri, She's a pioneering transgender rights activist from Delhi, and she's the founder of Mitra Trust and India's first transgender modeling agency. Isn't that fabulous? Rudrani is a paragon of hope and resilience, and she advocates for LGBTQ rights and social inclusion. Welcome to the chat, both of you. Thank you for doing this. I'm very grateful. Thank you, Anshu. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you both again. So, Shweta, I'm going to start with you. Now, you have this really interesting journey where you started with a Bollywood dance company and you, and now you're doing anti-colorism activism. You've written a book. Tell me, what was it that triggered you into starting? Was there a point where you thought, okay, right, this is it. I've got to do something about it. So it's been, I mean, it's, been a massive shift right uh when you you know are kind of deep into your bollywood dance career um sadly uh because you grow so immune to all to colorism around you and and you don't even realize that a lot of the bollywood songs have the word gori goria chitti in it um because colorism is so normalized that actually that was one of the things that made me feel really guilty about um about my journey when I started to unlearn colorism and when I started to really kind of, um, you know, reflect on my own experiences. Um, the one thing I guess that I would call is the became the catalyst for me to kind of start writing my uh, story is the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020. Um, as you know, in London, there were lots and lots of protests you know, around the world. It became quite a movement and rightly so. Um, there was a lot of talk amongst uh, South Asians on social media about how we are very anti-Black and, you know, we are actually pretty racist ourselves and we need to start looking within. And that really hit me hard because I remember attending a protest myself and I asked my children to make banners and, you know, I was there like very passionately uh, wanting to support the community, the Black community. And I was talking to this Black man at the end of the protest commending him for sharing his personal experiences, some of which included physical violence. Um, and I remember wearing this red cap because I didn't want to catch the sun. It was in a park. It was a beautiful day in June. And that was the specific moment where guilt hit me really hard because I couldn't look him in the eye. I realized that I'm standing for a community, but I'm not appreciating that community fully because I don't want to be as dark as them. I shifted my cap because I didn't want to catch the sun. And that was the very specific moment where I felt such tremendous guilt and, you know, the hypocrisy within. I came home and after that, you know, it was just sleepless nights, really, to be honest. And I started to really kind of um, uh, delve uh, deep and into my own kind of personal experiences and how I got here, how I got to this point where I became so blinded, you know, immune to colorism that it became such a blind spot. Um, despite having been through pretty traumatic experiences myself. 
And that's when I decided to write my story, when I just told myself enough is enough and I need to call myself out and I need to pull out colorism. And the only way that I can do that is by sharing my story very, very raw and honest. So Shweta, clearly your career, your dance, your art had an effect because you were picking up something in the words which were triggering something. Do mm -hmm. you remember the first trigger point as a child when you felt like this is not right? Very vividly. Um, so I was six years old. Um, just to give everybody a bit of context um, in a couple of sentences. I was six years old. My parents decided to move to Japan from India to start a new life. Um, because I was in school, they didn't want to interrupt my education. Um, Japanese schools by... I guess, you know, in terms of their rules, they only took Japanese children by race in their schools. They did not take even mixed race children and private schools were out of question. So they enrolled me in a boarding school. I was in India as a six year old um, in a boarding school for two and a half years when my parents were all the way in Japan in the 1980s. Um, at that time, I only visited my extended family, my nanny's house uh, every fortnight. And I was dancing on this coffee table because dance is something that I've always loved and been passionate about. And I was dancing on this coffee table, you know, not a care in the world. It was like my moment, my thing. And my aunt yanked my aunt, pulled me down. And she said, um, look at you. You've turned. Um, there's a phrase in Hindi. Bang and luti, kali, uh, kasa kali ka luti, bang and luti. Yeah. And another aunt said to her, well, she's enjoying it so much. Let her let her enjoy it. Let her let her be. And. She said, well, what good is she going to get out of it? It's not like she can become a Bollywood actress. Have you not seen her? Color? I thought that, you know, as a child, as, as a six-year-old, you've got dreams. And uh, that dream was shattered very early on because I was told that I'm too dark to be a Bollywood actress by an aunt. That's devastating. That's heartbreaking. I can just imagine what you went through as a child. Rudrani, coming to you, now you're an inspiration to a lot of people, including me. You've significantly impacted the LGBTQ community through the Mitra Trust. Now tell me, what was your trigger to start this? And what challenges uh, did you face along the way through your advocacy? So, uh, thank you for your question. I mean, what I'm doing right now was never planned. I mean, it it was not something I really wanted to. But, you know, uh, from a very young age, because of my femininity, I faced a lot of rejection, you know, rejection, which kind of, you know, nobody was under, uh, nobody supported at that time. Nobody was there. There were no, you know, such organization uh, who all can help other people like me. So, you know, when you feel rejected from your family, when you feel rejected from your friends, you feel rejected from, you know, so-called your social environment, it, it, it hurts a lot. I mean, for a transgender person like me, I believe uh, for anyone in this world, you find one, you know, safest place, which is your home. And when you start getting this rejection from your home, not necessarily, you know, your parents, but there are other people because living in Delhi, living in India, we do have big families, you know, joint families where everybody do have some kind of opinion and and something according to them which uh, does not fit. Uh, they are always bullied. They always target. And at a very young age, I also faced a lot of, you know, sexual harassment from one of my close family members, elder. And these all things remain in my heart you know emotionally it always it, it was kind of you know breaking me every day breaking me down every day and at that point my mother said if you if you want to live your life you know as how you want for yourself then get your education that's the best thing you can do and after getting my education i realized if not people like us who are you know who are a bit privileged in sense of able to finish their education because a lot of transgender people they don't even able to you know make it to 10th grade they drop out because of the harassment and other things and this is where they don't understand anything about themselves they just live in a life thinking that they have done really something bad in their past life and this life they're suffering for it it's just like you know god have punished them 
and and I was aware of thing. I was educated, and I thought if not me or like people like me, then who else? So I think this was the point. And one of the organization at a very young age where where I visited, who were working with the LGBT community, they said this thing to me like if you want to visit again, you have to behave normal. You have to act normal. And I was so shocked to hear it from an organization who's who were running a project for a community. And this is that was the time when I stepped out. You know, uh, people like so. What did what like did they me. mean when they said to you? Sorry to interrupt, Rudrani. What did they mean when they said to you, you have to act normal? So at that time I was young, going to school, but of course you know, eighteen plus. So. I wanted to understand myself. I'm 78 born. Imagine for somebody who's a trend fader, you know, you don't have in, enough information. At that time, there was no internet, you know, there was no Google and there was no literature. There was no, you know, civil society organization working for community openly because of the section IP, uh, Indian Penal Code section 377. So according to them, as per my appearance, I was not acting the same. So they, what they meant, if you are coming in this avatar, then you have to behave masculine. I mean, you cannot show sign of your femininity because people gonna mock you. People gonna, you know, neighbors gonna mock where the office was located. This organization was located, but it was a problem for me because this is how I wanted to express. This is what I believe. This is who I was, and I was never, you know, apologetic about who I am. But I just wanted a correct resources for myself. And this, these all are the points. It's, you know, coming from the family, coming from, you know, organization who claim to work for the community and other different places. It can, it, it, it was never one single thing for me. It was, it's not, you know, one, one day this happened to me and next day I was, no, no, I want to fight and, you know, get something. Each and every step from growing up going to school, you know, meeting your neighbors, your, your, you know, your, your family, extended family, to other spaces, wherever I, I was there, I was mocked, I was, you know, feel ashamed, I was made, you know, feel guilty about myself. At least what I'm going through, if we start something, at least we start, you know, from scratch, maybe there will be a day where we'll, we will be, you know, seen i mean this is very vague and people still say i mean you people are also human so i it makes me you know feel at, at that time it was same we as a trans people are seen as you know demigods or somebody who, who is evil kidnaps children so i wanted to change the whole idea i wanted to change it's also the you know bollywood they have created a lot of nonsense uh, you know uh, representing uh, LGBT people. So everything, every little thing which happened, which was for me as a human being, as a transgender person was not right. I think this all triggered me. What were your primary challenges that you faced? Uh, of course, you know, uh, coming for everything, you need some kind of support. At least if you need, you need, uh, you know, you, you need human resource, people who are well informed, you know, who can do things for you or you know we all can come together so when i started there were very few people from the community who were educated who were literate so community mobilization was very difficult as community lived in their own world thinking you know we don't deserve anything and this is okay and this is what our life is you know people at that time used to go for sex work and not use protection thinking even if we get you know hiv infection and aids will die, it is okay, because we deserve to die. So it took a lot of time. It took a lot of time to make them believe that, no, it's not okay. You you need to love yourself. You need to respect yourself. You don't have to, you know, think always one thing that you are not a nice person and whatever happened to you, it, it should not bother, you know. So it was crazy. It was something, sometimes girls from my community who were living with their partners, used to get so badly beaten up that most of them I've seen dying. Most of them, when, and nobody was there to go and find out next day, where is she, where is she gone? All of a sudden she's disappeared. And everybody was aware, the you know, the partner, the boyfriend killed her. So these were the oh situations, I think, in the beginning, when we wanted to, you know, fight for all this, get justice, there was no support. At least now there is a lot of support structure.
Uh, first of all, I feel that I'm a labeled activist. I don't even, you know, identify a lab, you know, myself as an activist. I believe what I'm doing is my responsibility, and I should be doing this. So when we started, I mean, I started, I started finding for people like me who were, you know, thinking the same way that uh, see, I saw myself as somebody who's re- who should be respected, who should be treated equally. So finding for people who think exactly like you is a very difficult. We are still struggling with, you know, laws have changed. Certainly, laws have changed, but the mindset is still the same. So I think uh, that is what it is. And when we started, we all thought of, you know. One day it will be changed before we we die, but everything is not done yet. I mean, there's a lot of work. Thank you for that, Rudrani. Shweta, I want to talk to you about something that Rudrani has mentioned and you mentioned. You both brought up Bollywood, right? So, I mean, you talked about how they talk about gore gore, you know, which is fair in the songs, and there's a lot of the songs that include this. Rudrani talked about how transgender people are treated. by bollywood or portrayed in bollywood films and that creates a perception now when you look at what bollywood does there is people who are trying to make a difference like i remember a film that was written by a friend it was called monsoon wedding a long time ago and they talked about they brought up some issues and one of them was uh, sexual assault and you know and how that was dealt with it was by a family member and how they dealt with it and at that point that was a shock to this was years ago it was a shock to a lot of systems do you think bollywood can do more because for every one story like a monsoon wedding or a thappar that you have you know films like that you have five stories also that are catering to the masses and saying something very different so how do we change that what can be done what should be done so i couldn't agree with you more i think um the entire indus- industry has a lot of work to do because i think they perpetuate so many toxic narratives um that unfortunately um you know sh- shouldn't be preached anymore it's 2023 right uh, we're almost in 2024 so whether it's a uh, patriarchy or it's mis- you know misogyny or it's uh, colorism racism uh transphobia there's so many issues that we that bollywood needs to tackle uh very 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 urgently um i know that there are movies that i appreciate now that are coming out i really like uh the actor ayushman khurana um who does uh, amazing work uh with his movies that touch upon um a variety of social injustices but the problem with um mainstream bollywood i would say and the kind of the pop stars and you know that that you have for example and i know i'm going to get a lot of uh, uh i might get some backlash from your uh, supporters and viewers on this and 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 mine which i have by the way but i no you won't you know why because we're educating people rocky orani right biggest blockbuster of this year absolutely love the movie i love it i mean it's been a while since an entertaining bollywood movie like that came out with a generally overall positive message uh tackling social uh, injustices right uh body shaming color shaming patriarchy you name it it's all in there um i did not like the way they tackle colorism because there's a scene in the movie that well first thing the movie starts off with ranbir singing and dancing to a song and calling himself gurgao da something something handsome boy gora chitta right um okay he's you know this is the beginning of the movie and he's learning a lot of things and he's been brought up a certain way then he talks about uh there's a, there's a specific scene about him being offered tea and he says oh i don't drink tea chai peene se kaale ho jate hain i turn, you know you turn dark if tea the uh you know the future mother in law calls him out on that saying what's wrong with being dark and his response to that is oh i don't have a problem with that at all black lives matter and yeah <laughs> and um you know i love beyond and rihanna and when i go on my long drives cruising around i do kanye and drake well that was such that, that, that was handled so so badly i thought in that scene because you don't want to be dark 
by because you don't you know you've been told by your grandparents and your community that you know dark is not beautiful dark is not handsome but you claim to listen to black music and appreciate black people but if you don't want to be dark i e you don't want to be their color where's how colorist right so actually um i really really disagreed with the way that that was called out um and then the third and final scene was him talking about how he did he wasn't aware that body shaming is bad and you know it hurts other people's feelings if you you know call a dark person kali and if you call a fat person golu and blah 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 and and then he and then he basically talks about himself he's like do you realize how much you hurt me when you i, I know what you think of me um you all laugh at me because i i don't speak english and i'm not educated but the thing is empathy is an innate human emotion if you feel hurt and i really believe in this strongly if you feel hurt by somebody's words how can you not know or see that you've just hurt someone else with your words mm. rudrani i want to ask you about something that you've mentioned as well in your last uh, uh, remarks and that you talk about in mitra trust as well and that is inclusive education i mean i think education is so important because there are certain areas which are just left out so people are clueless from their textbooks when people pick up a textbook they're clueless about what's you know about so much out there do you think if a lot of the issues we're talking about today were included in textbooks were taught to children were told a storytelling would that make a difference i think the solution is for sure that everybody needs to get this education because you cannot keep it away from them for a very long time there are a lot of uh, uh, you know especially if we speak of chatisgarh chatisgarh news is a news thing where they do have a transgender uh, persons you know uh, story in their textbook for the school children which is a very good you know a beginning and very recently ncrt also did the same thing uh, they have you know uh they do have a story of a trans person in their literature book so there is a change i won't say everything is the same which i i went through and uh, what i experienced you know 10 15 years ago but now there is a slow change and i'm sure it it is not you know something which is which is change in one snap it is of course going to take time we have been very patient and we have been doing this you know and whenever we get time i mean this you know like pushing the envelope we do it every time whenever we meet stakeholders you know gatekeepers and other influential people who can change the system we have been you know doing that and slowly we are getting this result we are uh, you know uh, seeing people talking about communities and they have different especially in offices also now they have you know they have entire diversity and inclusion thing and they are also supporting other smaller organization who can go different places and educate recently i went to tagore international public school uh, they have their entire you know group of uh, children who organize uh, sessions around lgbt community and it was such a you know beautiful thing to you know see and you know feel that kids of you know younger age with the all consent of their parents in school do want to understand community and they they are not at all you know afraid and fear of you know this other human being who who may be different but you know who who may be not like you know all of them but they are not scared of them they, i mean it's it's i think i i am witnessing this change so i'm pretty glad i mean i'm happy about this yes there is there seems to be movement and that's yeah. what's important and you know a lot of the stories that i a lot of the sort of strong beliefs that i had have were told to me as stories by my great grandmother when i was really small so here shweta i know you read a book for children or you did the series for children called dave and ollie where you had uh, you were introducing children to global festivals through the storytelling technique tell us a little bit about that because that was quite a unique way of influencing a child's mind um yeah so definitely 
basically came about um, again because of you know something mm-hmm. very simple, right? That we all um, very often, you know, whether it's a business or activism, it, it, it stems from our own personal experiences. And Devin Oli, in this case, was from my experience of having two young children, um, realizing that they don't have books that I can bring to them um, that where they see themselves. Where's the representation, right? There was hardly any back then. Uh, this is 2015, I'm talking about. Um, picture books either had animals or they had white characters. So I decided that I want to obviously like have uh, a British Asian boy uh, represent, uh, be represented rather in, in the book series and write the book series in such a way that it's not, it doesn't have much religious uh, material. It's more about the tradition and the festival so that any child can pick up that book, enjoy learning about a festival with Dev and Oli, Oli being his magical bedtime owl that comes alive at night and takes him to these festivals. They have an experience and then they come back in the morning and they've learned something. Usually it starts off with a problem. For example, the book Kite Crazy starts off with Dev receiving a kite for his birthday, but he doesn't know what to, what to do with it. He doesn't know how to fly it. So off Oli goes with him to the biggest kite festival in the world in Gujarat. Um, and they enjoy, you know, a kite festival, and he learns how to fly a kite, and and he's and he's back. So the book was the the, the series, in fact, um, Camel Caper, based on uh, Pushkar Camel Fair in Rajasthan, Kale based on Holi, um, and then I'm writing the next one, which is going to be based on uh, Onam. Um, and then after that, I'll go into global festivals, international festivals. Uh, so the idea behind the series was to basically educate children from any background and a festival is like a window right into the world of a specific culture you get to learn so much through just one festival and that promotes inclusion because you understand somebody else's culture their language their music their their art their food a festival encapsulates everything The book series, for that reason, I think has been popular because a lot of children from other backgrounds, not just Indian children, are enjoying learning about these uh, festivals. And, you know, their favorite, of course, is the kite flying one where they, when I visit schools, they want to learn how to make a kite or actually fly a kite. It's been been wonderful to actually promote inclusion at such a young age. Thank you. And Rudrani, your work, with fashion has been really groundbreaking because in this world of internet fashion you know a lot of young people look at fashion to set their standards in a lot of things so how tell me how do you hope your modeling agency will help with diversity and inclusion how has it already helped the fashion industry with these uh- the only reason why you know i started india's first transgender modeling agency is because of again a rejection i i believe it was end of september when i wanted to you know uh, go in this shopping mall to book a small you know place to eat and you know invite my friend but i was not allowed to uh, you know go inside and they blocked me and they said one thing that in Hindi, they said, Aap jaise logo ke liya kuch milta. So that means like, uh, there is nothing available for people like you. Uh, so I stood there and I tried to convince this guy that I'm no threat, I'm no harm, I'll just go inside, I'll do my business and I'll peacefully come out. But he kept on repeating that there's nothing available here for people like you. And the idea of this shopping mall or any, you know, places it's it's about you know good place uh you know good place where you can eat or maybe you know fashion there's big posters of models and you know your your fancy articles brands and this is when i realized that how you know generally people see us as somebody who begs who sell you know themselves for money as a sex worker and there is no other image of us and then people, you know, if 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 you go to any layman person and say, just close your eyes and think of a transgender person, oh, he can only they can only visualize of somebody who's begging and doing, you know, sex work. So I thought if there's no point, you know, fighting with this gentleman, 
because he's just doing what he's asked to do he also said my manager ordered me that you know people like you cannot come in and this is when i decided that we going to start in years you know first trend in the morning agency because all these you know when you want to create awareness you cannot sit inside you know your office and just speak to your people and go to you know some government's place so there is a lot of challenge people who also give us job they they believe that you know they're doing big favor so they'd like to use our, our time and everything but they don't want to pay us so challenges are still there but i believe it's it's you know the milestone is there now i mean there is a journey of course there is a journey i'm sure one day one of our models will be you know getting same amount of work same amount of money same amount of respect and everything so i think we have just started there's a long way yes. to go but i think we'll reach there we'll reach there yes, but this rejection may be so <laughs> and uh, you know i saw this series called made in heaven and you know i mean that was so good that they're being able to pick up issues like that and uh, tackle it they had they talked about transgender issues as well and i was really happy to see that and they talked about colorism issues as well ashweta uh, so and a lot of other issues they they i really liked the way that made in heaven did yeah the second series picked up a lot of issues which is so common people don't even realize like we said that those are issues and they were dealt with so shweta tell me over the next decade what changes are you hoping to see regarding colorism and representation in society and in media um so i mean what i would like to see is number one most importantly more and more people feeling confident in their own skin celebrating their color and sharing their stories talking to people about their experiences because i really believe that once we start to have this uncomfortable conversation whether it's to do with colorism or any other form of bias um just to touch upon you know what um rudrani said earlier about um uh the the journey and how it's uh, and you know and and you mentioned about education i feel like alongside education what we need to start doing is also having these conversations openly whether it's yes, with an agreed circle or whether it's actually coming back home and educating our parents yes they're of a different generation even our grandparents once you start talking about your experiences and how it makes you feel chances are that your mother will have gone through colorism chances are your grandmother will have gone through colorism and you're opening up a pandora's box right and once they start to share their experiences they'll start empathizing with yours um, the one thing that i'm really proud of doing and i feel that i i would really like more and more people to do that in the next 10 years is when i started writing my book and i called my mom and i told her i want to write about my experiences my story and we'd never spoken about this by the way like all my childhood trauma about the, the boarding school and everything locked up in a box and i buried it somewhere when i started talking to her about it um and i said i want to write about colorism the first thing that she said to me was what difference is it going to make this is how it is in india and will be for a very long time kuch farak nahi padega it won't make any difference these were her exact words two years later i basically i persevered and two years later i kept educating her kept educating her two years later she was the biggest champion she flew all the way from india to london for my book launch and she actually oh, even said oh amazing and she said that she wishes that she had understood how much of an impact colorism has on a child's self esteem and instead of brushing it off so oh, both your stories are making me cry by the way <laughs> this has never happened before in a podcast amazing i'm i'm so proud of her i i cried at my own book launch so did she and you know she's 67 years old she's set in her own ways she's obviously of that generation where she's grown up in a very patriarchal family and um that her opinion doesn't matter and she was my biggest champion and she unlearned with me so for all Amazing. those people who feel like you know you've lost hope on your parents or your grandparents please don't lose hope have these conversations with your family because they will come around eventually they will come around because they love you and they want you to be happy 
What an amazing transformation. What an amazing transformation. I mean, that's what you're both setting out to do, right? To transform people's opinions, the way they think. Rudrani, tell me a story like this about in your life where it's been a huge transformation that you've seen made because of what you do. So now I think how I see things have changed. People, they want to come to center and get education. They want to learn English. They want to learn their computer class. They want to learn their nail art. So from a point that we are useless and we are nothing to a point where they feel hope, hope where they can live their life with respect and dignity. I think this is amazing. I mean, you, you, hope you and really worth. feel your self-worth. Is what you're, you know, what you're telling me. Self love, self worth, yeah, and everything. So the, I mean, this is what this is what makes me feel, you know, amazing about what <laughs> what we have been able to do, and also the kind of change because all the work now parents accepting, you know, accepting their children, and you know, people talking about equal, uh, you know, marriage rights, adoption rights. So I think everything has changed, but there, there cannot be one particular incident where things are totally changed. But of course, one, the credit I, I give, you know, the entire credit I also give to my mom because when I was very young she, and she was aware of, you know, she knew who I am. And that's that's when she said, like, whatever you want to do, but don't screw up with your education because that's the only one tool which can take you out of mess. Maybe, you know, like life is not going to be, you know, uh, fun for you. I mean, it's not going, everything is not going to be so easy for you, but it will at least make a little bit of, you know, things easier for you. So I think that's what, uh, the day I decided, whatever, I'll not go, you know, I'll not start my transition till I get, you know, my basic education. I finished my school, but I was not able to go to regular college, but I was, you know, doing distance learning. But of course, the point when I realized how important education is, you know, going to school and, you know, finish, it, finish your studies, I think that is that, that, that is what makes me Rudrani today. Otherwise, I would have been the same person, you know, begging or selling my body to survive. Amazing, amazing. And amazing to your mom for understanding and supporting you. The other thing I want to ask you is that, you know, how sometimes someone we were talking a lot about education, right? My generation had zero education on a lot of issues. I've learned a lot from my 25-year-old, 26-year-old. She's the one who's taught me a lot about issues, about bias. She goes to every, she went to the Black Lives Matter march. She goes to a lot of the LGBTQ marches. She goes and she supports a lot of places where people are not included. Tell me, Shweta, how have your experiences in India and UK influenced your pers- perspectives on your colorism issue? Because you've now lived in two very different countries. Um, so uh, I was in India from the age of six to eight. Then after that, I did. Move and to- Japan. You lived in Japan. Exactly. So three countries. Three countries. Um, you know, I was in Japan for, say, 11 months and then about well 11, 10 and a half months six weeks so every some every summer vacation we would only go back to india um and then i moved to the uk in 2000 after i got married so in india colorism is rife it's in your face it's everywhere um you know talking about bollywood again you see you, at that time you saw bollywood film stars uh endorsing skin whitening creams um you know we didn't have google back then so we didn't even check about whether these ingredients in the skin whitening products are actually harmful for you or not. At that time, at that age, I thought, oh, well, they're endorsing it. It must be good. It must be right. Right. Because we saw Bollywood actresses as like these exactly idealize them. So um, as a teenager, especially, uh, that's how I grew up. And because I was constantly taunted at about for my color, being the black sheep, quote unquote, in the family. My father's family, by the way, is very fair. I mean, they didn't even look Indian. They were that fair. And um, my mother's very fair. My perspective of colorism was essentially um, that it's everywhere and that I can't do anything about it and that I have no choice but to give in. And then guess what I did? I ended up using skin whitening creams myself. 
for a very long time. Um, in Japan, colorism was rife there as well because I was predominantly in a South Asian community and I was bullied for my color amongst, again, my, you know, my peers, my uh, schoolmates, um, being called the ugly duckling. Um, when you grow up in a place like Japan and you are, you know, and you look like this, darker skin, curly hair, not straight hair, and you're slightly taller, you're slightly bigger. Everything was different in comparison to petite, dainty Japanese girls, right? Uh, and fair-skinned, dead straight hair uh, and petite, dainty Japanese girls. So I stuck out like a sore thumb and I felt it from very indiscreet stares um, on a daily basis on the train journey every single day to school and back. Um, coming to the UK, ironically, was the first time that I was complimented for my color, not by a South Asian, it's in, the, it's in the mind, it's in the mindset. But it was English people who would compliment me for my color. Um, and I mean, that's the biggest irony of it all, isn't it? Um, that they think that you have this beautiful skin tone and the world, the Western world has moved on to a different narrative, which is tanning. Whereas in India, people are still obsessed with the fair is beautiful narrative and how the skin whitening industry there is growing at a phenomenal rate, ironically. So, yeah, so there are three very different perspectives, I guess. But what I've also learned um, it, throughout the 23 years of living in the UK um, and having traveled the world a lot more since I moved to the UK and not just India, Japan, India, Japan, I've seen that colorism is rife essentially in the entire non-white world. Entire non white okay. world. Okay. Everywhere in Thailand, as I saw skin whitening products where my daughter caught me red handed buying a cream. Um, I just visited Vietnam recently. I've seen them in Turkey. I've seen them in Egypt. I've seen skin whitening products everywhere. And you think the skin whitening industry is growing even today? You know, so coming back to your question earlier, which I got carried away with sharing the story about my mom, so I couldn't tell you about the uh, representation in the media world in, in 10 years from now. Sadly, we, well, sadly, the skin whitening industry is growing at a phenomenal rate, even though there is so much work that is being done um, with, with uh, regards to activists like myself, and there's quite a few others now, and I'm so happy to see that. And we're starting to see more representation in the media world. We're starting to see beautiful, gorgeous, melanated beauties, as I call them. Never Have I Ever, or it's Viola Davis and How to Get Away with Murder. Um, Bollywood, long way to go. We still need to see that sort of representation. But yeah, we are starting to see it. But this is why it's such a big problem still. And this is why we need to keep working towards fighting colorism. In 2020, the skin whitening industry was valued at $8 billion, $8 billion. That's a huge number already. By 2026, it will have reached $12 billion. Interesting. Wow. And Rudrani, tell me, just like Shweta is hoping something happens about this. As someone who's at the forefront of the work being done for the LGBTQ community in India, what are your hopes and predictions for the future in India and globally? Uh, as what all I have lived and what all changes I have seen, I'm very, very positive, very optimistic. But I always say, you know, when somebody asks me, what do you want for yourself and community? I said, what you're getting, I should be getting the same. So I believe this is what I want to see, uh, you know, real soon before I <laughs> Yeah, equality is very important and same equality and equal opportunity, same same respect. Even if we, you know, speak of wages, I, you know, people, how it is seen that all of a sudden men one day realize that we need to liberate, you know, we need to do something for women. And they all started, you know, taking workplaces. But I always, you know, feel like that men one day realize that women are cheaper labor. So let, let let's bring them. So I don't want to, you know, experience the same. I mean, just because, you know, in the hierarchy of genders, if you see us, you know, at the bottom, it doesn't mean you have to treat that way. It's just your way of thinking. I can be, you know, anyone. 
I can I can be the prime minister of this country if I'm given you know equal opportunity. So that's what I want to see. Same for Absolutely. all. Absolutely. Yes. yes. inclusion equality equal opportunities equal respect absolutely now finally i want to ask both of you what advice do you have for young people who want to help who want to make a difference but they don't know where to start shweta you first um so i would say uh talking from my own personal experience um start with yourself start with talking about your own experiences so and if you um find that that's difficult for you then then start with writing about your own experiences write it in a journal to begin with get it out to uh, work on your own healing first um because i feel like when you want to make a difference you need to uh start on that journey that fighting journey with your cup full so start with your own healing look within uh change begins with us i really believe in that and that's how i started so i would suggest doing the same if you want to make a difference um and once you start to share your story and your experiences you will be surprised at how many people resonate with it because you know one of the things that we fear most is what will people think well guess what most likely they're thinking the same thing they're just too afraid to say it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. agreed agreed and rudrani what about you what would you advise them uh, for younger i think uh, now yeah, i who all i hang meet i i i believe they're already you know uh, aware of things it's 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 just not like my time you know whatever mummy papa say is being you know first and last i mean there is no in between and we, there is no scope we can you know whatever she said is the correct thing. but now today's kids do have a lot of resources i think the best thing they can do is let's not wait for other people to get you know educate themselves start from yourself you know break this communication gap just don't you know sit inside your car and think about other person it is nicer to know somebody instead of you know just having your own imagination about someone so i think i i'm already uh, you know seeing this chain but i i hope you know there are other people who are still do have lot of transphobia you know lot of different uh, negative thing about different communities without even interacting with them so start doing that then you can have your opinion i mean i'm not you know i don't want especially young one or any one to everybody to love us what you can do is you, you cannot love us if you don't appreciate us but just don't hate us i mean that's simple absolutely absolutely and you know what i always tell people all the time if you don't understand something ask so i'm sure rudrani or shweta if someone came up to you and asked questions about what you do you would happily answer them and that's what our session today is about trying to make people understand um but at the end of every session we do a quick rapid fire round to summarize the session so shweta i'll start with you first a book or film that deeply influenced your view on biases um so one movie um that comes to mind straight away is dhamini um it was a movie i think at least 20 years old um based on um sexual assault uh of labor class uh, a maid in a rich household and how this actress uh she stood up uh for it and she you know wanted to speak the truth but she was silenced by her family um and the bias that you saw for labor class because their their lives are basically insignificant and how the movie progressed and how she fought against all odds including her own family um to fight for the truth and get this uh maid in the house justice brilliant absolutely brilliant lovely thank you the most unexpected place you found inspiration for your acti- activism um well i mean it's unexpected in a way because my daughter was only 9 years old when she caught me buying that cream in thailand um so i would say she has been my inspiration lovely um, lovely that's wonderful actually you know our children these days they know so much more and they teach us um but yeah she has been one of my biggest um inspirations and and she's like a she's a, she's my role model actually 
Um, if you could broadcast one message about biases on a global billboard, what would it be? Um, we all bleed the same. Lovely. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Rudrani, one stereotype about the transgender community you wish to debunk? Oh, there are many, but I, I, one of them is like, we kidnap children. No, we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> A word that perfectly describes your journey as an activist. Uh, unapologetic, I mean. Wonderful. Uh, your biggest inspiration in the LGBTQ rights movement? Uh, my guru, her name is Lakshmi Narayan Tripathi. She herself is an activist and I really admire her work. She's very bold and, you know, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both, you beautiful people, for this lovely chat, for your powerful insights. I'm very grateful. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. I hope you learned something new. I learned a lot today. And I hope we brought you a little closer to leading a healthier, happier, more hopeful, more inclusive life. If you have any questions or any topic suggestions, please get in touch with me at unshu at wellnesscurated.life. As you know, I love to hear from you. And please do subscribe to our channel, Wellness Curated on the podcast and Wellness Curated by Anshu Bahanda on YouTube. It just enables us to get you more speakers and provide you this service for free. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.